um, uh, more informal than usual uh, class format this evening. Um, to a large extent, not so much because of the uh, parade earlier, which I think most folks have recovered from, um, but because of Halloween. Um, but I should just note that uh, I uh, was in touch with about a dozen uh, representatives of uh, uh, local uh, and uh, uh, available ethnic media. And several of them said, yeah, we'll be there. And then they uh, slowly began to cancel as they realized that tonight was Halloween. And the last of them, uh, the last of the cancellations came just about 24 hours ago where uh, the uh, publisher of, of Brown Window, who was uh, scheduled to be here, said, oh, something came up with his daughter. Uh, <laughs> And, and she wouldn't be able to be here. Um, and I don't know what costume she's wearing, but uh, Chuck here and I were just talking about the fact that um, his being here tonight means that uh, he will not be wearing, as he has for the last uh, several years, a beaver costume um, uh, in Jamaica Plain, handing out uh, candy. Where on Center Street? Yeah. Yeah. On, on Center Street. Um, I wish I'd known. I would have been out there to see this. But um, so we're going to make uh, some small changes in our format tonight. We will talk about uh, local media, and um, in the uh, class for matriculating students that precedes this. Um, we had a very brief conversation, which will continue in this larger format, um, about a number of local uh, papers uh, that I've picked up and brought, and they are being distributed amongst you so that you can see them. Um, they run the gamut from the uh, Jamaica Plain Gazette uh, to the Bay State Banner, uh, the Rainbow Times. Uh, there's a newspaper that I found at um, one of our major uh, Caribbean uh, grocery stores um, that's actually uh, published in, uh, in the Jamaica, I believe it's Jamaica as opposed to Barbados, um, which, uh, uh, which paper has become a, a leading paper for uh, folks in the Caribbean community. Um, we have uh, copies of the Huntington News, which uh, some of you may not have seen, but this is the local uh, Northeastern University paper. And we will talk about uh, the nature of uh, uh, local media uh, in terms of shaping some of our policies. Um, and uh, I've got my uh, long-term colleague uh, Chuck Collins here to talk about work that he has done um, in reference to the uh, uh, building uh, by my agency, the uh, Boston Planning and Development Agency, of uh, hundreds of condominiums in the city of Boston, which now lie empty, um, and how and why it was that uh, the work that uh, uh, he's done, the research that he's done, appeared first in a local uh, publication before uh, the uh, Boston Globe picked it up. So we'll talk about um, both his work and, and that transition. And then I want us to take a little bit of time towards the end of our class to talk about our expectations for media coverage uh, between now and a week from today. Uh, the uh, midterm uh, will be next Tuesday, and when we meet uh, next Wednesday, um, we'll be able to start to debrief the election. But I, I want us to have some conversation about, about our expectations of um, what uh, we may be seeing uh, in the media in this uh, last week of run-up. Um, and we did have a little conversation about that in reference to the 
um, October surprise that uh, is ostensibly rolling out uh, tomorrow around uh, uh, Mr. Mueller and, and uh, his investigation and his personal life. So um, we'll start with a video and uh, then we'll plunge into our discussion of uh, local media and how local media uh, is affected by and affects uh, some uh, national policy. I don't think we'll talk much about Whitey, uh, but if the subject comes up, uh, we're, we're open to discussion on that subject as well. So, um, how long is the video? Two minutes. Two minutes. Media getting treated like a commodity is a problem in U.S. society, especially news media. When large corporations come in, they buy local stations, and then they absolutely dismantle the coverage, putting profit before coverage. That's my concern. So what you're seeing is a complete loss of local control of media. You're seeing fewer voices that are telling key stories to Americans about their education system, their development, jobs, and really their communities. And I think it's a huge issue. As it stands right now in the United States, we already have a handful of media companies that control 90% of what we watch, read, and hear. It's not that many of these local TV stations are losing money. The issue is how much more money can corporate media need from these local markets in order to return a greater share um, of profit to investors. That's the issue. So when we talk about sustainability models, I think we have to kind of almost take a, take a step back and look at the issue of, it's not that they're not making a profit, it's that in the eyes of shareholders, they're not making enough profit. News isn't any other widget. It's not like any other product that's made in a factory. It's not like any other service that you purchase. News helps us understand who we are. It helps us understand our local communities. It helps us understand America's role in the global system. And I think that when you put profit above information, it really has a huge effect on democracy. And, and that in itself is uh, a key element to the bottom line of what we're talking about uh, tonight. That is to say, um, pardon? Who was that? Oh. That was someone from NBC speaking. Yeah, the NBC logo was up there. Sorry. We'll, we'll get to that. It's a good little clip. Um, be useful to know who was saying <laughs> Yeah, it says it at the beginning of the video. It's an American University professor. Yeah. Okay. That gets us a little closer. Um, in in um, making the uh, many uh, phone calls and sending out many emails I sent out uh, for um, speakers for tonight, one of the things I was reminded of is how small most of our local media are. In fact, um, when one looks at a masthead or uh, a website, you'll see half a dozen or eight pictures and, and names of individuals who are the publisher and the editor-in-chief and, and the reporters and whoever's handling the advertising and maybe the name of someone who's handling distribution, although I have a sense that Many of the papers are distributed uh, through a, a kind of shared process. But when you actually go online uh, and send an email to the editor-in-chief, um, it's not like you get uh, a response back within two or three days. I mean, there was a time when communicating with a reporter or a publisher um, would get you a really fast response because they wouldn't really know whether you were calling with breaking news or 
um, a, a bit of advertising that was going to help support the paper. And uh, what I found over the past uh, month or so uh, in communicating with uh, the various outlets uh, is that sometimes they get back to you within a week and sometimes they get back to you not at all. Um, whether it's a phone call or an email because they're so stretched out. And if you go to their offices, as I went to uh, one of the newspaper offices uh, first thing this morning to pick up some of the papers, uh, the offices are these tiny little holes in the wall where very often there isn't any single living person in the office itself. Um, it, there is uh, a place where people may gather periodically, but these are very small operations. The Gazettes, um, which cover uh, much of Boston, Mission Hill Gazette, JP Gazette, what have you, um, seem to be published not by multiple entities, but by uh, some sort of uh, small holding company. And then each one of them has an outlet somewhere in the city that uh, distributes uh, uh, the press. So we're talking about an enterprise that is not some large sort of corporate enterprise at all. We're talking about um, a number of small, uh, passionately run uh, neighborhood-based entities, almost all of which, as we discussed in um, our matriculating class, are distributed free of charge. Bay State Banner uh, is in barbershops, supermarkets, hair salons, uh, 7-Elevens, um, uh, little grocery stores, bodegas. Uh, the uh, Gazette, which probably has a wider distri distribution than most of these outlets, is actually distributed uh, to, uh, well, they make an effort to distribute to every household in Jamaica Plain, but they're delivered um, on a Friday or Saturday to your doorstep. Um, uh, but uh, with most of these publications, uh, you don't have to pay for it, uh, which creates the business model uh, example that says that it's more important that everyone have access to this news uh, than that the newspaper uh, charge you a fee, which really only covers a small portion of the production cost anyway. So as was the case uh, in the later days of, uh, of the Phoenix and Boston After Dark, um, advertising pays the expenses and then the papers are uh, distributed for free. And that in itself uh, both creates a certain freedom but a certain set of constraints around um, what it is that can show up in, in the papers. Um, uh, uh, editorial. So with that, I want to turn this over to Chuck, who will talk um, both about why he has chosen the media, he's chosen it to tell this story, which is a very important story about Boston and, and where it's going in terms of, of its development, and to talk a bit about uh, the, the substance uh, of the story. And he will be back in the spring as well. Um, when we do our series of uh, presentations on inequalities in Boston. But, uh, Chuck? Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Uh, happy Halloween. Um, I want to introduce my colleague, Annie Martinez, over here, a.k.a. Robin Hood. Uh, she is the director of something called the Jamaica Plain Forum, which is kind of like our open classroom at the neighborhood level. It's sort of a film lecture conversation series. And she came along to see the open classroom and, uh, because you know, we're also trying to create space for face-to-face -face conversations, which I love about. I've been in the audience and participated as, you know, just in these discussions, and I think it's a great space that Ted and others here at Northeastern have created. Um, and I'm not actually, I'm not in uh, the journalism field. I'm, I guess I'm more of a researcher advocate, uh, but I think a lot about media because, uh, you know, if you write a report. Uh, in the forest and there's nobody there to cover it. Did the report really exist, you know? No. So the whole point of all the work that many of us do is to try to tell a story, is to try to get into the news. And as the news media keeps evolving and changing and facing different constraints, uh, the harder it is to do that sometimes. So 
uh, we're constantly saying, well, how do we get this out? And um, I am a big fan of a lot of what I mostly seem to be weeklies in Boston. They're just very, uh, including the JP Gazette, which you know a week would not be complete, or it comes out every two weeks actually, but it's uh, it's there for, you know, you're, you're, uh, and I remember when people started the East Boston Community News uh, in the 60s or 70s with the slogan, East Boston is not an airport, um, to really kind of lift up the, the issues from the sort of neighborhood perspective. So I think we are blessed to have this, these, these uh, weeklies uh, and then cut across, and then cut across also different identities, whether it's, uh, um, you know, the Bay State Banner or the citywide, covers citywide issues uh, or more targeted weeklies. Um, so I should say my day job is I work with the Institute for Policy Studies, which is a research group. I, I mostly look at issues of inequality and kind of global inequality and the rising concentration of wealth and power. Uh, so I co-edited a website called inequality.org. Uh, I just released a study uh, this morning on wealth dynasties, how wealth is sort of accumulating more and more in certain families. So the Walton family, the Koch family, and the Mars family have seen their wealth increase 6,000% back during inflation since 1982. Those are the kinds of things I look at. But what really is challenging is how do we take these issues of inequality and how do they touch down in people's lives? And uh, one of the things that I was puzzling over was, though, not just in Boston, but the sort of the rise of luxury real estate in mostly the coastal cities, you know, New York, Boston, DC, Miami, and the West Coast cities. This is a phenomenon. It's a hugely disruptive phenomenon. If you've been in any of these cities, San Francisco is sort of the worst, meaning it's like this inequality dystopia. Um, but here we are sitting in Boston, and if you walk out the door and you look over, you'll see this building going up one Dalton place. Average condominium, you know, it's gonna be $6 million, 61 stories, it's gonna be the tallest residential property. But this, this is just one of a dozen plus others of large, you know, luxury, both rental and condominium projects that are in the pipeline. So um, let me just say a little bit about the content of the study, but then talk about the process of how did it reach out and connect to the sort of weekly papers and the like. Um, so we were curious, uh, who's buying Boston? And we were trying to understand uh, the force, uh, the, 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 what's changing here? I mean, this isn't just uh, your grandparents' gentrification. There's some other dynamics here. One of them is uh, global wealth. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of wealth coming in from China, Russia, Dubai, other countries where wealthy, you know, multi-centimillionaires and billionaires are trying to figure out how do they get their money out of their home country and where do they park it in a way that could hold value. And lo and behold, it's touching down here in our communities. And uh, if you live in Chinatown or the Fenway, if you've walked around the Fenway, if you know the Fenway neighborhood just in the last 10 years, you know, it's been utterly transformed. We know the seaport, which started off mostly as sort of warehouses, is now kind of a, um, I call it like a luxury sacrifice zone. You know, it's like, you know, we're just gonna build luxury housing. We're not even gonna have like a library or a police station. We're just gonna have high and luxury housing. Uh, but there's a sort of set of neighborhoods that are experiencing this disruption. And yet our observation was that we weren't really having the kind of conversation we needed to as a city, as a community. Um, you know, we, we know there's an upside to luxury housing. We know it creates jobs. It brings in property tax revenue. The city of Boston does actually an excellent job negotiating with developers to get some linkage funds out of each of these projects that goes toward affordable housing. So we're trying to figure out how to make the best, the most of this affordable housing. And, and if I could yeah. just uh, um, insert a thought here, uh, one of the um, distinctive aspects of the creation of this uh, luxury housing, uh, uh, particularly in that area, 
America, but to a lesser extent in the Fenway, um, is that there's almost no retail that accompanies that. Uh, there's no supermarket. Uh, there's no school. Um, uh, there are many restaurants. Um, there's been a lot of discussion over a number of years uh, about how desirable it might be to have um, a Whole Foods or a similar uh, purveyor of daily needs uh, in the neighborhood, and that has not yet emerged. Uh, so what it means is that the people who are living in those units are either not living there full time um, or are using uh, other ways, Amazon or Uber or drones, to bring in uh, their basic uh, uh, daily needs. Um, you know, paper for the kitchen, um, let alone food. Um, and so that means that at a certain level, um, there is at least an implicit intention of making those units investment units uh, as opposed to making them the kind of housing um, that is normally associated with building a community. Okay. Your image, Ted, of drones delivering groceries got me thinking that in, in, in the Fenway there's a building uh, um, that uh, has what they're, they, they're selling sky cabanas. Uh, meaning you can buy a uh, 16 by 16 porch on the 30th floor. So maybe you have a, a luxury condo on the 20th floor, but you sort of have a porch up there. Maybe that's where the drones could deliver your groceries to your luxury cabana. Um, anyway, so the, so we looked at a couple of things. We looked at primarily ownership units, not rental properties. We looked at 1,800 units. Uh, we found that two-thirds of them are residents that don't claim a residential exemption. Uh, so they're not taking the tax, tax benefit of saying this is our, our primary home. That doesn't mean they don't live there or part of the year. It doesn't, but it means they're not qualified or they don't choose to take a residential exemption. It may mean that the unit is rented out, so it doesn't necessarily mean it's vacant. We also found that a third of the units are, have been purchased by trusts or limited liability corporations. Again, this is not that unusual. More and more luxury properties are being bought by shell corporations. What was really troubling was about half of those were uh, Delaware-based limited liability companies, which is sort of the premier secrecy jurisdiction. So we started to look at what we would call red flag transactions. Uh, you know, so uh, let's say uh, one week we find a, uh, a condominium purchased for you know eleven million dollars in the Mandarin Oriental uh, condominium development on Boylston Street. Uh, purchased with a wire transfer from the British Virgin Islands owned by a shell corporation. That's a sort of a, a red flag that maybe this unit is not necessarily somebody's home, but it's sort of a, a conduit for illicit funds. So that was some of what we looked at. So our, our point there was not to say that all luxury housing was bad, that we shouldn't be building it, but uh, let's look at some of the potential perils of that. What impact is that having? on the rest of the housing market? Is it having an impact on land values? Is it having a ripple effect? Uh, you know, a lot of people like to say, well, a lot of these luxury units are people from the suburbs who've emptied their nest and they're moving back to Boston. Um, you know, but in fact, what we're seeing is a lot of these are owned by uh, uh, shell corporations, international buyers. And then when we drilled down into uh, voter, voter registration, what was really interesting was how many units what percentage of units in some of these luxury buildings like Millennium Tower uh, have a registered voter living in the apartment? We found that it was uh, it was less than 30% in most of those buildings. And just by contrast, if you look at uh, public housing that is within the immediate neighborhood, we're seeing voter registration levels of closer to 80%. So that notion that wealthy people tend to be you know high, higher for voter registration rates doesn't hold up in these luxury properties. So again, we are starting to get a picture that many of these units are, as Ted says, they're not really homes. They are wealth storage units. They're investment uh, new properties. And um, so what, why do we care about that? Well, the other 
interesting thing is we're we're building new uh, gas infrastructure to service these properties, and uh, we, we there are probably you know thousands more units in the pipeline. So we, as a city, a coastal city with obvious challenges in terms of climate change, are going to allow uh, new fossil fuel <laughs> pipeline infrastructure, gas infrastructure, to be built to service these buildings that, as best as we can tell, not many people are living in. So that's that's a, a peril and a risk. And then there's other risks just of um, you know the fabric of a community. Uh, what happens when you have a lot of units that are sort of not occupied, that they're not engaged, that people are, are um, so that was a story we wanted to tell. And we knew from neighborhood activists in the Fenway and Chinatown and uh, a number of neighborhoods that this was uh, a concern, that they were seeing the impact on affordable housing, the displacement, the rising cost of land, and that this rippling out. The families that wanted to buy downtown weren't able to pay those prices. They were moving into Jamaica Plain, into um, the East Boston and other neighborhoods. So. Um, and one, one thing that I learned just looking at it was, that, you know, uh, you know, I think of the Boston Globe as our flagship print publication. Uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on One Dalton Place, I looked at all the stories that had been written about One Dalton Place. There was, there was nothing that was at all critical. Uh, there was an article about the impact on birds of building another glass tower and how that was going to be bad for birds. And there was an article about the developer you know, Richard Friedman and how he's a colorful, salty character, and this is his last big project. Other than that, there was really, there was no other article till August when uh, they had the capping ceremony, uh, which is when they reached the top story, and they put up a tree and they have a little ritual, and the mayor was there and, and others. Other than that, there was no discussion about any potential downside. Um, so it was our real now, observation that this was really a discussion that wasn't happening. And, and, and again, I, we don't know why the Globe, you know, we know that all news organizations are under tremendous constraints. They don't have the resources, they don't have the shoe leather reporting resources that they did. There, there, there are spotlight groups, there are, you know, foundations now that are funding investigative work, but we know that they're constrained. But the other thing is we know that the real estate is a business beat. Uh, it's it's uh, you know Tim Logan who does most of the writing about real estate in Boston is mostly writing articles about the next big project you know and so uh, there's not a lot of space for kind of a critical community discussion and yet it's happening in the neighborhoods I see it happening in the weeklies that are talking about the lack of affordable housing um, and, and uh, if I could interject uh, there again uh, wearing my uh, BPDA, BPDA board member hat. Uh, to the same extent that there uh, has not been uh, a lot of discussion about the potential downsides, this similarly has not been a lot of discussion about uh, the potential upsides for the city. And clearly there are at least two uh, that I'm aware of. One is that uh, those kinds of uh, uh, buildings throw off huge annual revenues in terms of their taxes. Uh, they make it possible uh, for uh, the city to have funding, which it didn't have, say, 20 years ago, uh, to support social services and education and public safety and a range of other things. But uh, there hasn't been any discussion of that. And uh, those added revenues have also enabled the city to have, uh, I think, the, the highest bond rating uh, that it's ever had uh, because uh, there's lots of revenue that flows um, without necessarily uh, a, a large negative impact on the actual use of services within the city. The point is that there's a discussion to be had about all of that on both the positive side and the negative side. And the question is, uh, how do you precipitate that discussion in a way that, that makes it really inclusive so that everyone gets to weigh in on it? And, and that, it seems to me, is where the, the neighborhood outlets become absolutely crucial. Yeah, and I mean, I would underscore the other uh, just to underscore what Ted said, 
you know, Millennium Tower, which is a walk around downtown, and you know where the old Filene store was, and uh, you know there's this amazing tower built there now. Uh, that building generates twelve million dollars a year in property taxes. That's, that's a lot of teachers and firefighters, and they don't have. And again, if they don't have children in the building or they're not sending children to the schools, the impact, uh, uh, you know, the, the cost of that is, is low. So, one of the questions is uh, for the benefit, you know, if, if, if Boston is becoming a global city that is helping create a stable uh, place to host all this global wealth, should we be asking more from them? You know, so. Uh, our perspective was we should look at what other cities have done. We, maybe we should have a very high end real estate transfer tax. You know, units over two and a half million dollars of transfer should maybe pay a higher transfer tax. Maybe we should have a vacancy tax uh, that discourages these properties from being vacant. Uh, so it's one thing if you have wealth storage units, another thing that's just sitting empty uh, at a time when you know other people could potentially be renting. Uh, should we be concerned about? The, uh, the secret ownership aspect of this. Turns out a city could require a disclosure of beneficial ownership in real estate, different than corporations, right? So you can incorporate in Delaware and you can buy, you know, you know, whatever you can have your illegal ivory operation laundered through your Delaware corporation. But if you want to buy a condominium on Boylston Street in Boston, you need to say who you are. Um, a humorous aside is uh, we had a wonderful research intern from Wellesley College uh, this summer, and she uh, tried to get a Boston library card, and she was living with her aunt and uncle, and she couldn't prove that she lived in the house because she didn't have a bill showing that she was you know, paying a utility. Uh, so if you want to get a library card in Boston, you have to show two important things. Who you really are and where you live and you have to prove it to purchase a condominium with a shell corporation you have to prove neither of those things so we think uh, real estate should meet the ppl library card threshold uh, that you know, should have the same level of disclosure as borrowing a book and uh, that's not the case but it turns out cities could do something like that. so we were we were sort of pushing to say let's Get some more for the for providing the safe haven, the market, the policing, the services that make this a great city to park your wealth. Uh, let's let's ask for more. Um, just on the media side, though, I want to say so. Um, we uh, we we immediately went to a number of the neighborhood publications that we thought would be particularly interested in this story: the Bay State Banner, a bunch of the neighborhood weeklies that I mentioned. And uh, they were very excited about it. I think it touched a nerve. I think they were eager to tell the story. We were able to get the Boston Globe to do a major story, and it came out on the front page. And it signaled to other media that this was a newsworthy story. And then we got all the broadcast media sort of followed that. Uh, so we had all the major uh, TV, radio shows covering it. So it, it, it was a robust three days of discussion uh, until the gas explosions happened on the North Shore, in which case media resources quickly shifted. But a three-day window is a pretty good window for any local issue to have uh, a robust area. Um, and we'll be back because we're going to continue to study these buildings. Uh, but my observation where it was that those local weeklies, those local outlets were really important in sort of building the interest uh, getting other media to understand this was touching a local nerve, this was a discussion people wanted to have, um, and, 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 and go forward. I should say I had a similar experience with the Boston Globe uh, because I live in Jamaica Plain but near West Roxbury. We had a huge fight over the construction of a frac gas pipeline coming into West Roxbury a couple of years ago. And we, could, we uh, over a, a, a two year period, you know, uh, 200 local residents were arrested blocking this pipeline. Uh, local clergy were in the leadership. Uh, there were all kinds of gas safety concerns. The, the gas uh, plant comes in and it's right opposite an active blasting quarry. Anybody from West Roxbury can tell you this was not a really good area to, 
to bring high pressure gas pipeline infrastructure and have it terminate and stop it. And yet the local and the local papers treated it like a major issue. Uh, and that the, the local print weeklies and the Wicked Local, which is sort of the online one of the Wicked, uh, which is a phenomenon that is is kind of stepping into the news coverage vacuum. Uh, and some of those local outlets covered it robustly. What was fascinating was to see how it didn't break through to the citywide Boston Globe, uh, periodically the Herald, but the but the Globe did one story and created one picture over a year and a half. With hundred, and this is West Roxford. So to me, it was a fascinating case study of whatever we were doing, we were failing to connect and tell the story in a way that was breaking through to our important citywide media. But local television, local weeklies, it was front page for years. That was the major story. So that was a fascinating case of how something didn't break through. Yeah, and uh, just for folks who aren't local, West Roxbury is a community that is heavily politically engaged. Uh, many of the city employees live in West Roxbury. Um, uh, contributions to political campaigns uh, come uh, in large numbers from West Roxbury. So it, it, it's not a neighborhood that one would think of as marginalized uh, in terms of its engagement with public process. Uh, and one would think that uh, the major media uh, would look at that issue in that neighborhood and say, well, this is something that needs to be covered because these people are engaged politically and they care about the outcome of this, of this kind of issue. I mean, I know now if uh, if this was happening today, you have had we've had this regional this large gas explosion. Now all of a sudden, news organizations are investing resources into looking at the gas and local safety issues. But two years ago, we could not get that. So sometimes a regional or a national story might have gotten we might have been able to attract more news resources into that issue, but for whatever reason, we weren't able to do that two years ago. Anyway, the, the, maybe those are my opening thoughts. And, and uh, one thing, though, that Ted said to me yesterday, uh, and I don't know if this, maybe you talked a little bit about the sort of the globe as a... Yeah, as a uh, when I worked uh, in the mayor's office, one of the things, uh, this was uh, uh, under Ray Flynn, one of the things that we're always concerned about was media coverage and how major media prioritized stories. How did they identify what they would send a reporter out to? And this was back uh, at a point in time when uh, the, all of the local press did in fact have people who went out to cover stories in large numbers. And uh, one of the things um, that uh, the uh, then managing editor uh, told us in, in one of the confabs that periodically occurs as between public officials and and uh, uh, leadership at, at some of the big media was that they monitored um, local media. They would read the neighborhood newspapers on a regular basis. And if they saw the same story, basically, showing up uh, either at length, that is over a period of time longitudinally um, in a particular neighborhood or if they saw basically the same story appearing in multiple different neighborhood newspapers, uh, say a story about uh, uh, jet aircraft noise uh, affecting uh, neighborhoods, then they would send a reporter out and say, and this is something that, that deserves to emerge from the community as a story that uh, gets surfaced and distributed uh, more widely. And um, <laughs> on the basis of that, we realized that if we wanted a, a story to get covered um, in the major media, there were moments when we would plant that story in multiple small papers so that uh, the, the Globe and the uh, television uh, stations would then notice it. But we would, we would make a conscious effort uh, to get a particular story out there. So, for example, 
And, and, and that didn't necessarily have to be a negative thing. It meant, for example, that if we were trying to get small businesses in the neighborhood to hire kids for summer jobs, and we couldn't get the major media uh, to, to cover that, we would plant that as a story in local papers in a way wherein uh, the major uh, outlets would then say, oh, maybe this is something we need to make a big deal over. But if we just went to them and said, we're trying to generate 4,000 summer jobs for teenagers, they wouldn't cover that. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of not sure that's the case anymore. I just I was just thinking again about these pipeline fights. You know, the Back Bay was a big fight over in Back Bay. Major story in, in the local Back Bay weeklies. Every week is over this, you know, do we need to build this new fossil fuel infrastructure to serve these luxury towers? But, same, you know, it's not really bumping up. It's not signaling to the citywide media that this is a legitimate story, so I'm curious about that. Well, and, and also in, in our matriculating group, uh, we had a discussion, and uh, I haven't had a chance to, to check this, and I was away for a week. We had a discussion about the fact that several weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, there was a demonstration here on campus uh, of um, about 100 uh, Boston Public School kids um, who were questioning uh, the commitment of uh, many of our universities, uh, not just Northeastern, and cultural institutions and hospitals, to making payments in lieu of taxes to the city to support city services that all of the nonprofits derive some benefit from. And they had done some research and they discovered that uh, the universities were contributing about uh, a quarter to a third to what it was they had promised to contribute when these uh, so-called pilot agreements were entered into. Okay, so uh, a local church, local to this area, uh, organized, as I say, about 100 uh, kids, and they had a demonstration here on this campus. Uh, and uh, it, it was probably outside of this building or you know, 100 yards from here. Um, and from what I've been able to tell, that demonstration received no coverage in the globe. Now, if they did and someone saw it, you should correct me on that. So even those of us who work here didn't read about, or students here, didn't read about that demonstration in the globe. And yet, the demonstration was covered in two local newspapers. Uh, there was reporting on it in the Bay State Banner, and there was reporting on it in the Gazette. And now I, I just picked up the student newspaper, and I'm not quite sure when this was published, but there's coverage of that in the student newspaper. Now, and I'm, I'm not taking a position one way or another on the issue, other than to say that the contributions of our major nonprofit institutions to support city services that we benefit from in the city is a significant point of discussion, both for the nonprofits and for the city. Uh, services are being rendered and uh, they need to be paid for, and everyone has agreed on that as a premise. One would think that our major media would have picked up on the fact that uh, there was at least now one demonstration raising the question of whether the fair share is being contributed. And yet, as I say, as far as I can tell, our major, major media haven't yet picked up on this as the subject of discussion. And so one has to ask why that's the case, and why was it that the local media picked up on this little demonstration that those of us on this campus didn't even know had taken place? Hmm. <laughs> so, um, before we get into our discussion of the of the um, uh, uh, the midterms, um, I did ask our students to think about what distinguishes, uh, apart from the fact that most of the media are free, uh, the print media are free. Um, what distinguishes our um, 
local outlets from uh, the major outlets, uh, both uh, print and, and digital. And they've had a little bit more time to look at the local newspapers and to look at the patterns that they've seen. So maybe they could comment on that um, and what that may mean in terms of uh, policy setting, if not necessarily on a national level, at least on a local level, since so much of what we're talking about uh, relates to um, policy setting um, here on a citywide or regional level. So, students, you're on. So, what distinguishes the local yeah. newspapers? Yeah. Students. Students. Here. Well, right. you're not you're a student, but we'll, we'll, and we will hear from you. The orange and black are great. <laughs> um, the local newspapers tell you what's going on in the neighborhood. They tell you what's going on in your town. They tell you who the local candidates are that you should vote for and why you should vote for them. They tell you what kids are or stars in your school, what kids, what new businesses are opening, what's happening in your town. And if you have a gas interruption, if you would know about it from that level. And if the gas company wants to uh, build a, a whole bunch of electric towers on your rail trail, well, you learn about that, hopefully. You don't hear what affects you personally or locally from the national news, you hear the policy of the plot now, but you don't hear how it really affects you. I think, as was alluded to before, um, looking at the basic NRSA, it covered a protest that I otherwise wouldn't have known about the issue of eviction, so um, it seems like it covers more like individual local people's like problems. Like, yeah. Um, I've had the opportunity to work at a local paper, not in Boston, but in my community, which is on Cape Cod. Um, and I think having witnessed um, the work that they do, a lot of it comes down to the amount of detail that they're able to give to specific issues that impact community members on a more personal level, um, especially with investigative stories. Um, they oftentimes, because they are free and because they don't rely on an intricate paywall structure, end up having the resources to have staff that are devoted to very um, it, deep issues within the community and are devoted to putting a lot of emphasis on those those issues and, and really digging into them, I think. It also strikes me that there's a default question. If these little papers didn't exist, what would we know and how would we know it about what was going on in our communities? Uh, many of the people I know who read local newspapers read them just to see the crime statistics. Mm -hmm. In part because local crime is sometimes so funny. Um, not necessarily to be sure for the victims, but um, more often than not, local crime is written up in a way uh, that um, makes it somewhat mirthful in effect. But what it also does is to tell you whether there's a pattern of break-ins of cars on particular streets in a way that encourages you to be very careful about leaving stuff in your car. And what it tells you is whether you need to activate a neighborhood crime watch because uh, there's been a pattern of breaking and entering into, into homes. Um, what it tells you is what cannot generally be told simply on a blog or um, in, in uh, the major uh, uh, large um, newspaper. And therefore, 
it's a way of building community because it uh, tells you what you need to think about in order to maintain a community that is safe and caring and well supported by neighbors. Um, and, and if all of that disappeared, then it raises the question of whether the definition of community that we use is one that is no longer based geographically, but in fact ends up being uh, uh, based around particular cohorts. So in going around to pick up the neighborhood newspapers, for example, I was struck that um, two of our most significant community building newspapers now are the Rainbow Times, which pulls together uh, the gay, lesbian, transgender community without regard to physical location, and uh, the paper that is published in, um, uh, in Jamaica that pulls together the Caribbean community, and also El Mundo and uh, uh, the, the other uh, Latino papers that are not based in one specific geographic area, but which in fact pull together different kinds of cohorts of self-defined communities. And that raises the question as to whether the sense of community now looks more like Facebook and less like where you live. And if that's the case, then how do we go about organizing communities that are stronger in terms of protecting real estate and other elements that used to be seen as the key elements of what a community is? One, one thing I noticed about these weeklies is they tend to have younger reporters, sometimes their first journalism job, they're weekly, so they're not in the sort of constraints of, of putting stuff out every day. And, but those reporters, they, it's sort of like the lost art of shoe leather reporting is still there. People are, you know, like in Jamaica Plain, I know the three reporters who work on that paper, and I see them all the time, and they are at community events. They're actually, um, and they're writing five or six different articles per weekly issue. You know, they're covering a lot of different things, and they begin to become uh, an important force. And the other thing I say is that the online news aggregators aren't competing with these weekly papers, meaning like the JP News, you know, they're lucky if they have one story a day that comes out every morning that they, that's that's interesting. So, and I remember, I mean, if you remember when uh, AOL was bought out by Time Warner, they made this commitment to create these patch, what they called the patch sites, and they actually had all this money for like a three year period to pay local journalists. And so for a very short time, we had these paid local reporters uh, contributing to an online newsletter. But then once the subsidy went away, meaning that they didn't have a viable business model to keep those, uh, those reporters paid, that vanished. So the weeklies continue on. And I don't know if anybody sees any kind of hyper-local there's a little, Wicked Local does that in some towns. They have a robust presence in like Dedham and places like that. The Wicked Local actually has a person, but otherwise um, they don't seem to compete with the with the weeklies. Um, an interesting or important aspect of uh, the divisiveness, like you said about how a lot of local events, local issues are only covered by local media, I think that as we see divisiveness on the national level in terms of media grow even further and intense, um, we also see that on a local level. Whereas if a local outlet is only covering a local issue, we don't get a, a larger narrative or a larger contribution to the discourse from other forms of media. The local paper or the local radio station plays a huge role in actually shaping the discourse around the issue, and most folks probably know everything they know about the issue from the local paper. And if they have a particular slant or a particular position on an issue, I think that, that goes a, a really long way in shaping how the constituents actually view the issue or or a candidate. I think like specifically in my local newspaper, um, they play a huge role in actually getting to decide almost how the constituents view the issues themselves. I know related to that, uh, 
um, one of the reporters writers from the Dorchester Reporter came to visit the School of Journalism and was talking about how their coverage of Ayanna Presley's campaign, which started well before and was far more robust than, than uh, mainstream media outlets coverage, led to when she ended up winning the nomination, she intentionally went to them to give her first interview to, to the Dorchester Reporter, which is, is part of what you're saying. And I think that also relates to the fact that like you were saying, Ted, the, the community papers can decide very intentionally based on what they define as community, what they are covering and are not covering. The way the basic banner doesn't cover crime as a as a sort of statistical tabulated statistics of crime, um, but they do cover city council in a way that sometimes even feels missing from the globe. Um, and uh, yeah, well, city council in a range of of uh, other. Uh, smaller scale issues. I've gotten a couple of calls uh, from community folk over the last week or so uh, about an announcement that was made uh, concerning the closing of a particular school, uh, which um, made the globe as part of a list of schools that were being considered for closure uh, in the coming year. Uh, the community that is impacted in Dorchester is rising up and trying to mobilize uh, support to uh, not so much not close the school because there's an acknowledgement that it needs to be renovated, but to keep the school community together, whatever happens, so that they can be relocated as a group and, and then relocated back into the renovated school as a group. There was one article in the Globe about this, and it, it, it listed the school in passing. Uh, but now a couple of the neighborhood newspapers, uh, including today's Bay State Banner, um, have articles uh, where they've interviewed parents and they've interviewed administrators, and they talked about the intention of this community to uh, sustain itself as a learning community whatever happens in terms of physical facility. And it's in the neighborhood newspaper that, that uh, there is momentum building around a mission uh, to protect this school. Um, and, and I also say that, uh, that the point that was made about the Dorchester paper seems to be absolutely um, correct. That is to say, major media missed the fact that Ayanna Presley was going to win. But the local newspapers knew it. And indeed, um, uh, the, the uh, incumbent knew it within 10 minutes of the time the polls closed. So why was it that the major media missed that? And what does that say for what is going to happen next Tuesday on midterm election day, where major media have been telling us one story about a blue wave that may or may not, in fact, materialize given the extent to which they may be embedded in communities that are actually going to do the voting. Yeah, you were going to say, then I want to move into uh, some discussion of, of our expectations of how the media will cover things and what it is we want to make sure we talk about before next Wednesday, so that when we get to Wednesday, we can test our own assumptions. Hi. Um, it's interesting how the, the digital media is panning out with, in conjunction with the wicked locals and the little closed um, Facebook communities things that are popping up, and the gateway kind of papers. Um, the older folks read the paper, the younger folks read the way to local, and that's how it seems to be going. But there was this huge roar for quite a while about whether you should identify yourself or not, because it was so blue in your language. <laughs> not blue, but you know. Four letter words about. And it, it was just dreadful. It took a long time for that to iron itself out. Um, it was like, oh, that was one thing. The other thing I was going to say 
remember now. It'll come back. Um, yeah, I would say to the point of like, what does that say about the predictive power of the mainstream media? Um, I mean, I would consistently do this after the continual election um, in terms of the mainstream media's ability to predict effectively, and I'm not particularly pleased by their predictions personally. Um, I'm going to wait and see. Okay, so. Let's let's try to begin to prepare for next week. Are there races or issues that you want to make sure that we cover? I mean, this isn't the formal part of, of our presentation next week, but are there races and issues that you want to make sure we cover in some depth next week in terms of how they're covered before and then after? Uh, next Tuesday's election. The nursing vote, I would assume, is one. But nationally. You keep hearing that this is a referendum on Trump, and it may well be, but the uh, the question I would like to, to have dealt with, uh, deal with next week, is, is it, does it turn out to be a referendum on Trump, or is Others? I mean, I want to know whether it's really a referendum on Nancy Pelosi. Uh, there was a piece in yesterday's Times that uh, listed the names of the uh, committee chairs. Uh, who would uh, take over uh, congressional committees if, in fact, the Democrats were to win back the House. And interestingly, of that group, uh, of the eight-odd people, um, most, almost all, are, are over the age of uh, 65, I think. Um, uh, but three of the eight are African Americans who've been uh, strong opponents of the uh, Trump agenda, um, and uh, you know that that's a kind of um, endorsement of Nancy Pelosi's agenda, as she stated it. And what we keep hearing up to now is that uh, a vote next week. Um, the president himself is saying this uh, is a vote for or against him but by implication also a vote for or against a particular uh, agenda, um, which has been largely articulated by Nancy Pelosi and some of the uh, older Democrats in Congress. It'll be interesting to see whether that's really the case and how the coverage of it may or may not diverge from uh, the fact that we'll be looking at a week from tonight. Yeah, I think if we look at the midterms nationally, um, it'll be interesting to see how, or see if there's another situation like uh, with the Electoral College or where the popular vote, um, like if in metropolitan areas, the, in urban areas, the turnout is really high, and so maybe there's a discrepancy between you know, how many people voted in urban areas versus how many people voted in suburban areas or in the Midwest, in the Rust Belt states, or and we have a situation, again, similarly, where more people in the country as a whole are turning out for Democrats or for Republicans, but then the results don't reflect uh, exactly that. There was a slide that was put up in, in our uh, matriculating uh, session, and I'd like us to throw that slide up here, if we could, because it we normally try to go through uh, uh, very recent uh, headlines. There we go. Uh, up uh, in the upper, in the mid left corner, um, there's a headline that may or may not be the October surprise that often uh, rolls out the week before the election. Um, apparently, there's going to be some sort of announcement on November 1st, which is tomorrow. 
uh, covering uh, alleged improprieties on the part of uh, Mueller. Um, and the question I asked our students was, if this story, these headlines showed up today, and you as a reporter were asked uh, between now and the election to dig into the story, uh, to test the veracity of both sides of the argument. Mueller says he's referred this matter to the FBI and uh, the, the person who has alleged these improprieties uh, has said that uh, we'll hear tomorrow what they are. So this could have an impact on the election one way or the other. And the question is, if you were a reporter asked to cover this for your local media, what would you do at this moment? And how would you plumb the veracity of these allegations in the week before an election? This, is, this happens, right? Every time we have a national election day. And I pose that uh, question to, um, to our larger group. Yes. Maddow um, on MSNBC last night had quite a, they had a, a couple of people on that have been really digging into what the source of this is and from a lot of different angles. And they said a lot of other people were coming at it from a lot of different angles. So they seem to be trying very hard to figure out whether this has any, any truth to it or if it's just something they said last night on, on MSNBC on the Meadow show that the person that's doing it has got a, a reputation for making spurious comments about all kinds of things. And the phone numbers for some of the sources um, go to his mother's house. And the, some of the pictures that he has in his um, media pamphlets and things that he puts on website are either professional shots you could get from anywhere or actors because they showed um, the similarity between some of the pictures and what he was using. So they're going at it from somewhat of a serious manner. And that would be good rather than just repeating the, the scare tactic thing like what happened with Carrie and this. And the boat. Well, a week from now we'll know, won't we? Oh. <laughs> or we may know. I want to know how politics are shifting in Massachusetts. The question was how politics are shifting in Massachusetts. Party politics. Party politics. I've seen too many black and gray flags. Over. What do those mean? Well, I think they're... What? How about that there are a lot of black and gray flags around? I've seen them on, mostly on the interstates and caravans. Um, I've seen, I know two anyway, and then I've seen some hanging up in people's windows or something. And I don't know exactly what it is, but the it was all pickup trucks on the interstate and flags that were United States flag in black and gray, the colors of black and gray. So it looks to me like some kind of right or right thing, but I don't know for sure. Well, you have a blue line in the middle, that's the police officer and you support police officers. You're talking about the thin blue line? It's a black American flag and it has a thin blue line. Supporting police officers. Ah. There's the blacks with a blue line, black and gray with a blue line. Yeah. Black and gray flag with a blue line through it that, that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. is about supporting uh, police officers, law enforcement, first responders, presumably. Okay. Well, it had um, Confederate flags with it too, so I didn't know how to take it. Okay. okay. 
All right, are there any other points that, that folks want to make sure that we dig into in greater uh, detail uh, between now and next week as it relates to media coverage? I mean, the, the results will be whatever they are. We'll certainly talk about those. I'm really interested in the coverage of all the, the increase in women candidates at all the different levels. Well, they could cover, um, and um, not well, depending on where it is and who it is, and so on. And then also for the follow up in two weeks, hearing uh, about how how well that's been covered. Because there are a lot of races for which, if, if a woman runs, as she was also, I think, in some candidates for Africa, some races for African Americans would be the first um, as well. So, so learning about those firsts at the state levels and the national level would be really interesting to me. Okay, so taking a look at how the, the media cover um, whatever happens vis to be the larger number of women candidates we're now in. And, and minority candidates. And, and minority candidates. And minority candidates. Just a little one for me, which is um, assuming, as they say now, that there is something of a blue wave in the the uh, house becomes democratic. Um, be interesting to see how the Republicans uh, react. I think the party, as we saw today, um, they're yelling at each other um, uh, for putting the amendment. Hmm. Um, I'd be interested to see. Um, who comes out to vote, like which which groups, and if the media, if we do see an increase in groups that traditionally don't vote as um, in as large numbers, if they do come out to vote, if the media will actually focus on them and why they decided to go vote instead of maybe um, pieces about like the white working class and how they vote. Um, so groups aside from the traditional groups that are usually covered. Mm -hmm. Not similar to that, I'm very curious about the coverage of um, the youth vote and if it's bigger or what, like smaller, like if that seems to buzz. I'm curious about that. So, if you need to Coverage of the youth vote. Okay. Um, I heard Jake Tapper talking about. He was on Trevor Noah the other day, and, and he was talking about admitting how slow um, the media coverage has been to kind of shift this different way of covering this administration. And although he gave this incredible speech the other day, he specifically did not invite CNN to um, to the interview process. So yeah, it would be interesting to include um, how to cover someone that's not giving you access to them. Um, okay, Chuck, any last comments? I guess I'm also interested in sort of the, like the Georgia vote, vote suppression and how barriers, restrictions to voting access kind of play out and uh, how we, how that affects the legitimacy of some of the races. That's my last thing. Okay. All right, so we'll be back here uh, in a week, knowing a lot more than we know now. Uh, the midterms will be over, or at least presumably most of the votes will have been determined by then. And um, be safe if you go out trick-or-treating at this point. Thanks for coming today.